Otherwise. Okay, I'm going live. All right. Say the word when we have gone. Hello, everyone. Hey. 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 Welcome to A11Y NYC, New York City's one and only accessibility meetup. This is our third year going. Uh, in fact, I think it's our third anniversary. Yes. It is. Anniversary. Thank you very much. Hey. So a couple of logistical notes. Uh, bathrooms you walk by on your way in, um, they are gender neutral. There are locks on the doors if you prefer more privacy. There's also um, a wheelchair accessible bathroom on the ninth floor. The keys are hanging uh, right outside the bathroom entrance over here. Also, thank you to ThoughtBot for hosting us today. Hey, uh, this is Thoughtbot's office. Thoughtbot does uh, web and mobile development consulting. Um, so if you're interested, you can talk to me. I used to work here. I no longer work here, but I can still tell you about it. Um, so they've been really generous in hosting the space. Also, SSB Bart Group has been ongoing, uh, an ongoing sponsor of the event, and we want to thank them for uh, their continuous support. So thank you, SSB Bart. And uh, on that note, oh, um, I wanted to say thank you also to Jolly over here with the Internet Society of New York. And he has been doing our uh, streaming, which, by the way, we're doing right now, uh, in case you're wondering um, when we were setting up. And so hello to everyone on the stream. Mirabai. Yes, Mirabai. <laughs> Mirabai is doing the CCI. Uh, Mirabai is doing the captions remotely. Uh, she works with white coat captioning. She's amazing, they're amazing. If you're doing tech conferences, if you're doing talks, if you want to have uh, any sort of meetings transcribed, uh, they're the way to go. So highly recommended. Uh, and am I forgetting anything? Thomas over here, uh, another co-organizer. Sean, Cameron, um, we're here to help. So if you need anything, holler. And uh, with that, I'll introduce Sean Laureate. And uh, take it away, Sean. Hi, everybody. So here I was thinking that uh, we didn't have a spot open for today, and it was January 3rd. Everybody has the holidays going on, so I may as well try out a talk I've never written. And now we have a full room, so no pressure. Great. All right. Uh, so this is how learning American Sign Language improved my alt text. Um, I put in this slide because I always forget to introduce myself. Uh, so my day job, I work at Google. I work on accessibility for Docs and Drive. I lead a team down in Chelsea working on that. Um, aside from that, as Cameron said, I'm a co-organizer here. Um, there's some caveats here. Um, I'm not deaf. I'm not a user of alt text. I'm not a linguist, phil philologist, or artist. I'm not a photographer, writer, or audio describer. Uh, I just like, in, make, like making things more accessible to everybody, and that includes when I just post stupid pictures on Facebook and Twitter and stuff. Um, this is also a rare presentation in which I will be reading all of the text that's on the slides because it's important. Um, I'm going to be presenting a bunch of pictures, but I'm also going to be reading the text so that people who can't see the screen can also get the captions, because otherwise if I just put it up and say, okay, read this for three minutes, then it gets really boring. So with that, uh, what does alt text do? So alt text is short for alternative text, and it's something that was introduced in HTML so that if you have an image tag, you can add alt equals this, and then in the quotes, you can add some text. So that way, if the image doesn't appear for whatever reason, it might be that at the time, the connection was slow and it would drop off and the image wouldn't load. It could be that you're using a screen reader and you cannot see the image itself. Then this text would show up instead of that image. So as an example of that, uh, this is alt text. A large hardcover book with yellowing brailled pages sits in a glass case below a sign. Pretty short, it's a little bit long for alt text, but it's something that if it was in an article or something like that and there was kind of an accented picture, you would include text like this so that somebody would know what it has. Uh, this is more of a description or a caption. So it has the same preface that I just read, but then it actually has the text on the sign. I'm gonna skip the French. Uh, a summary of the history of France, Paris, Royal Institute for Blind Youth, 1837. This is one of the rarest books in the collection. It is the first full-length book published in Braille, printed at the Institute for Blind Youth in Paris, where Louis Braille studied and taught. 
it's quite possible that Louis Braille could have handled this book. Uh, and this is from the American Foundation for the Blind's Helen Keller Archives, which coincidentally is like two blocks that way. It's pretty cool. Uh, they have a huge museum and archive. Highly recommend checking it out. It's awesome. And this is the picture. So pretty straightforward. The alt text is just, okay, this is uh, the important thing that's in this picture is the book itself. It's below a sign that's describing the picture. So I'm gonna talk about uh, basic structure of visual description in ASL first, and then we'll move on from there. So when you're describing things in ASL, you have kind of a restricted area that you're working with because you are speaking in an inherently visual language. You are using your hands in kind of this space, maybe for me, it's a little bit wider than shoulder length, kind of a cube about that, that dimension. So if you start with a description of, uh, say, from how to get from here to where I live, and you start by saying, okay, well, you go out the front door, and here's Broadway, and then you hang a right, and you go that way. The description is essentially at like one hundredth scale, or one tenth scale, something like that. Way too big, so the description's like nearly a mile long because it's, it's so big. You have to get it down to the point that you can talk about everything. So you start with Manhattan itself. So you say, okay, here's Manhattan, and then you have the entire island. I live up here. And that's how you do it. You paint a picture from the very largest granularity and then narrow it down from there. Uh, so like I said, start big, setting the stage. Um, when talking about pictures specifically, you want to get into, okay, what is the style that uh, this image is in? If you're describing a painting, you need to convey that kind of style information along with it because if it's pointillism, that's gonna be important. If it's huge brush strokes that are really thick with the paint coming off of the actual painting itself, that's also really important. And that's just the style. That's not actually the content yet that you're getting to. And then going into detail, but selectively. And this is important because otherwise you can literally lose the forest for the trees. Because if you're describing a mountain with a forest on it, you don't wanna go, okay, mountain, and here it is, and then on the side there's a tree there, and there, and there, and there, and there, and there. No, you just go, psh, trees. And then include an interpretation when it's valuable. And we'll talk a little bit more about each of these steps. But above all, keep it concise. Because otherwise, you'll be describing things for so long that the people that you're actually conversing with will have forgotten half the crap that you've covered already. This is the basic structure of visual description for blind folks, which I've uh, adapted as a really soft word. Uh, from the Art Beyond Sites guidelines for verbal description. I've included a light link here and I'll tweet out the link to the slides later. Um, this page is super cool. It's actually like 16 different categories of things. They have um, the different topics along with examples and descriptions and guidelines for each of the different steps. And I've condensed basically 12 of those down to three. <laughs> so the first subject, form, color, orientation, medium, and style. And then use specific words and provide vivid de details and echoes. Uh, I'm going to keep talking until things mellow down a bit. How's that? All right. And then explain intangible concepts with analogies. And this is also something that we'll get into in a little more detail later on. Uh, but above all, keep it concise. Uh, because again, if you have a description that goes on and on and on and on and on and on, if somebody is reading or hearing that from a screen reader, even though most screen reader users will have the, the speed cranked way up, that's still a lot to listen to. And by the time you get to the end of it, you're just kind of worn out and bored and you don't really want to listen to this anymore. Um, so it's an interesting read. This, the Art Beyond site, uh, of course, as you could probably tell by the name, is very focused on art specifically. So they have all kinds of things about creating tactile displays and things like that. It's really cool to read through. Uh, but that's not why we're here today. Okay, so here's an example. And the room may look familiar for those who are seeing the screen at the moment. I'll read the alt text in a second. Uh, I took this picture from right over there where Thomas is sitting. Yep, just like that, pointed right out these windows. It's dark now, so the view's a bit different. Uh, so the alt text, this is something that I tweeted during one of our uh, previous meetups. And the alt text that I added is Pedro standing and presenting while the attendees at the conference table listen and look on. View out the windows of the sunset hitting the financial district to the south. Now, the actual context in my setting the stage for this, hang on, I'm gonna do the thing that I have. 
Google Slides has a laser pointer, and I love this now. <laughs> um, I didn't think I would love it, and I use it every time. It's great. Um, so the actual setting of the stage is the entire first sentence, because the thing that I actually wanted to do was highlight this amazing space that ThoughtBot lets us use. So the context of this picture is actually Pedro standing and presenting while the attendees at the conference table listen and look on. The actual point of this photo is to brag about the view of the sunset hitting the financial district to the south. <laughs> okay, laser pointed off. Okay, so getting into each of the different parts, kind of step by step. Uh, part one, start big and set the stage. So there's a whole dip bunch of different aspects of this that you can incorporate. Uh, this list is not comprehensive, this is just some ideas. So the time and place, is it inside or outside? Environment and surroundings, or just any other general attributes that might be helpful. So for the picture that I have behind here, which is partially hidden, but it's all right, because there's alt text. A crowded David Geffen Hall, Lincoln Center, has viewed from the highest center balcony while the New York Philharmonic sets the stage for Beethoven's Ninth Symphony complete with a full chorus filling the stage with hundreds of musicians and singers. So the setting of the stage was actually the place as well as the time as well as the context. So the, the context itself is they're setting up the stage for Beethoven's Ninth Symphony within David Geffen Hall at Lincoln Center. And that tells you where you are and it tells you the general state of the actual room itself. So you, you don't have to go into like, oh, and there's an audience and they're sitting down because you can infer that. You don't have to go into like, oh, this is three balconies up because nobody cares. Um, the highest center balcony gives you the perspective, which is important because I am way up in the nosebleeds and I'm looking way down at the stage and I'm seeing the actual detail and the part that I found important that I wanted to highlight is that the stage is completely filling up with musicians and the chorus. Um, all of these pictures, by the way, uh, I took because I didn't want to mess with copyright and stuff. Um, and it's just things that I posted to like Facebook and Twitter and stuff like that because then I didn't have to write new alt text for other things. Okay, step two, go into vivid but selective detail. So this can be a bit of a challenge, but it can also be kind of fun. Um, so the key questions to ask are, what do you want to highlight? and what distracts from that. Because you want to focus on things that is actually going to enhance the overall experience of the image, like what is the purpose, why did you do this? And you want to avoid any details that are just distractions that don't really matter in the first place. So for this, I wrote, looking south on the Hudson River toward the George Washington Bridge under a severely cloudy, rainy sky. Two kayakers sit, chilling on the water, and one of them even brought an umbrella. It's really hard to make out. But right here, <laughs> there's a guy sitting there with an umbrella in a kayak in the rain. So there's a whole bunch of other things that I could have included in with, with that. There's you know, the Fort Tryon Park on the left. There's these old burnt out pilings from piers from when there used to be boathouses there 100 years ago that have long since burnt down. There's a barge parked across the river just kind of hanging out, but it's hundreds of feet long. It's huge. And then there's the Palisades, which is the cliffs on the other side of the river covered in green trees. There's the buildings of Fort Lee across the way, and there's the, the view of the river going down underneath the bridge. But none of that mattered, because the only reason I took the picture is because this one dude brought a, an actual umbrella with him out kayaking. And I thought that was hysterical. <laughs> okay, this is another example of selective detail. This is one that uh, a friend of mine recommended as something that was particularly impactful for him. So with this picture, there's a lot going on. And some of it is important for setting the stage and actually having you know where this is and the, the actual context for the picture. Uh, all of this beautiful scenery, you need to at least establish that before getting uh, to the point of the picture. Uh, this is the view from Sao George Castle Wall in bright midday sun over the surrounding neighborhood rooftops matching in red tile but haphazardly arranged on the side of the hill leading down to the water's edge. In the next door garden below the wall, a large brown dog lays on, sprawled on his back, flashing the world. <laughs> so down there on the left, there's this very large dog, which is very small in the picture. 
And as a note, this was actually a great caption to include. Uh, I posted this on Facebook, specifically because if I just posted this picture, a lot of people would look at it and just be like, oh, that's pretty, and swipe away. But by including a caption that specifically leads people to the punchline, then more people get to enjoy the actual point of the picture. Three, including interpretation. Uh, this could be analogies. This could be just where do you want to take the description? Where do you want to actually lead people's emotions as they're uh, getting the same experience that you had and that you want them to have? This is the one picture that I didn't take, but it starts off with, I got this picture. So I received this wonderful e-card from the College of Physicians of Philadelphia and the Mutter Museum, wishing me happy holidays. The card shows the top of the tree with the usual shiny ornaments and lights, but also small skull ornaments and an intimidatingly lifelike angel of death on top adorned in white. Flowing robes, translucent to the point of resembling cobwe cobwebs with skeleton hands peeking out at the sides, complete with hooded skull. So some interpretation there, not a huge amount, but enough to basically say like, this is a scary looking angel of death with like a gown made of cobwebs. And if I just described like, oh, there's an angel of death on top, it's, it would sound cute and that's not the point. <laughs> they didn't make that to be cute. I mean, they did, but <laughs> it's cute because it's scary. Uh, that's an awesome museum, by the way. It's in Philadelphia, I highly recommend it. Um, I love it. I adopted one of their skulls. You can go and see my name in front of it. It's really cute. Um, okay, so for this picture, uh, the text is really tiny because I could barely fit it in there because there's a lot going on in this image. And I don't have the image displayed because I want you to focus on the actual visuals themselves and then we'll see how well this actually transforms. So uh, if it helps, close your eyes, listen, um, or just read along with me. Uh, so the, this is a panorama from the office looking south over Chelsea and down to the financial district. To the east, you can still see blue sky over Brooklyn, some clouds gathering directly overhead in Manhattan, and then a different scene starting at the Hudson River. Above Liber Liberty Island, a pocketed glow of the afternoon sun contrasts with a looming gray wall of rain running north along the river. The clouds jut out over the top of the wall of water, a frozen wave just beginning to crash over the city as it finishes engulfing Jersey City and Hoboken across the river. So interesting visuals, but it is a picture. So form that thought in your head and then we'll see how well it translates. There's a lot of other things I could have pointed out, but I thought that made sense. FYI, that fits in Twitter's alt text, <laughs> which I highly recommend you add. <laughs> if you go into settings, it's under like display and something else. And it, it's on the iOS app, the Android app, and on the website now. Uh, you go in there and you can enable alt text and then you can add all of this. And then your actual tweet can just be like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> it's way more, it's like 460. <laughs> um, so step four, I didn't include in the main structure but it's still useful to know and keep in mind. And that's breaking the rules for effect. And it doesn't always work, uh, but with this picture that I took, following the usual structure didn't really help. In fact, it made it sound really boring. And so I ended up flipping it around entirely and starting with the smallest piece. A canoe moran, two canoes strapped together with two by fours, <laughs> rests on a small rocky beach by Yonkers Canoe Club on the edge of the mile wide Hudson River calm with just enough ripples on its surface to add texture to the reflecting light of crepuscular rays streaming through dark gray clouds. So here I started off with literally like the smallest detail, which is there's a canoe and then built up. Okay, now it's on a rocky beach and then, okay, now we're going acro across the river and now we're describing the actual environment that it's in. And it was one of those things that had happened to work that way. So the rules are there to help, but the, they're also there to be broken occasionally. Okay, everybody, your turn. So I want folks to tweet a picture to hashtag A11YNYC. If you're on live stream, feel free to do the same. And reply to pictures and add alt text. Uh, try to use the same form. 
Uh, start big and general, and then get into detail selectively, and if if you have space in your tweet, and if it helps, uh, include an interpretation, but above all, keep it concise, and Twitter will enforce that. You have to keep it concise. Um, so while people are doing that, I need a volunteer to come up and do one live, because I have one more picture here, but I want somebody else to do the description. Okay, come on up. Just mind the wires as you're coming up. Stand right by him so you're on camera. And also so the mic picks you up. All right. Yeah. Okay. So here it'll come up. It'll come up on my screen as well. So remember, start big in general. What's the context? What's the environment? What's the style? Then go into detail, but only selectively. And for this one, it's super easy. You don't really need to include an interpretation. Ready? Okay. Um, looking at a wall with several different um, markings or <clears throat> words that have been written on it. Uh, in particular, there's a message written by a person signed Jack that says, always buy your magic beans from a trusted retailer. <laughs> Thank you. That was it. So yeah, for added context, it's a bathroom wall. It's in a bar. No idea. <laughs> uh, it's in the Burp Castle down the East Village. It's great. Uh, but yeah, this is like my favorite piece of graffiti ever. Um, okay, so we have gotten some people on there. So have people found pictures? Found some? Do you reply with uh, a caption? All right. In the interest of microphones, Awesome. So we have this picture here. A lemon rosemary cake sits glazed on parchment paper. A sprig of fresh rosemary is perched on top. Awesome. All right. Anybody else? We have a whole bunch of. We have a picture that Tom, Thomas took of me. <laughs> Okay, well, we can review some more later if people would like. Uh, but again, just basic review. Uh, start big and super general, like set the stage, make sure that people know what the actual context is and what kind of the boundaries of this world are. Then go into more detail, but only selectively. Include an interpretation when it's valuable, but above all, definitely keep it concise. Um, there's a whole bunch of links for resources in here. Uh, Art Beyond Sites guidelines for verbal description. I have a link to Art Beyond Site, the overall site, as well as uh, the guidelines that I spoke to before. Learn ASL. There are places in the city where you can. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, the Sign Language Center, there's, uh, I think there's a location here in Manhattan. Uh, the site has a whole bunch more information. LaGuardia Community College also has, it sounds intimidating, but trust me, it's okay. They have an ASL English, English interpreting program that starts with ASL classes. So you don't have to go in and be like, yes, I want to be an interpreter. You can go in and just say, I want to take ASL classes. Um, and then as a side note, uh, the American Museum of Natural History reached out when we posted this meetup and said, please, people let know about Project Describe. Uh, it's this project that they've just launched uh, it's projectdescribe.amnh.org, and it's a site. So they have 30,000 images, this backlog of images, that they have no descriptions of. And so you can help them out by basically going to this site and describing images, but you can also vote. So you can review images that other people have captioned and say, this one is better. Um, the describing is kind of handy. So I pulled up one image which this looks like an, a whale swimming through ice, uh, which is awesome. Uh, but one of the things that's important to note, uh, especially because it's really subtle in their UI, is they have this little button that says context. And if you hit that, it opens up another page that gives you the page where this image came from. And so now you can actually go through, oh, okay, they're talking about all this other stuff. There's a World Science Festival, but it, they're talking about Arctic waters 
And here's the actual context where the image is. And so you can see the caption that they have around the image. So you don't have to make it redundant, but you can make it just helpful by describing the visuals of it itself. Um, and then you can review things. So here's a picture of a dude. Hi, dude. That's Carl. Hi, Carl. <laughs> So there are two descriptions here. One of them says his name, senior scientific assistant, and the other one says his name, middle-aged white male with dark beard and buzz cut hair. Click. Um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you for coming. Any questions? Okay, Sveta has two questions. Um, I'm going to interpret, but it's going to be slow. Oh, so when I showed the picture of the man in the kayak with the umbrella, uh, that was really hard to make out. Okay, let me see. Oh, here we go. Zooming doesn't work on this. Okay. <coughs> Oh, that's true, that would work, wouldn't it? Um, I'm only doing this because otherwise it'll go totally full screen and then we can't see anything. Um, okay, the captions are gonna go away for a second. Right, so when, when you zoom, I can see it, but if but if I didn't see the description, I never would have known that the man was sitting in the kayak with an umbrella. Um, so when it's not projected on something kind of grainy, it's a lot easier to make out. So like in the context of, of me posting this, I forget where I posted this. It's either Facebook or Twitter, one of those. That's the only thing is I use. Um, but in that context, you can make it bigger and then you can zoom in on it yourself. Um, but it's still really small. So that's one of the reasons why uh, I included that caption regardless of like whether you're using a screen reader or not because otherwise you would just look at it and be like oh it's a rainy day and some jerks are kayaking but if you can actually see it and go oh that's actually a purple umbrella uh, that was the first that was the first sorry I think it's great that Twitter added the ability to add alt text, but but why does Twitter limit the number of characters for the images? What if you want to describe more? It makes, you, makes me feel frustrated sometimes because you want to explain more words than, and then Twitter limits it. So I think that's one of the reasons I understand why Twitter sets up the limit for the limit for the tweets themselves, but why would you set up a limit for the the images? Like that doesn't make sense. I'm not sure why. I have no idea. But <laughs> they made the limit a lot higher than tweets, so hurry for that. <laughs> I mean, one comment on that, like screen readers don't have like a navigation mechanism for like image descriptions, at least built into them now. So for a person using a screen reader, if they were reading like a long image description, there's not like a keyboard shortcut to like jump past that or navigate inside of it. So I mean, that's potentially something maybe for more innovation in screen readers, but that's that's why a lot of people only put, say, 150 characters in an image description, usually more the length of a tweet um, because of the way that they function. So that's maybe one, one reason why they, they didn't make it. Thanks, Thomas. And then there was a comment from you. Yeah. A lot more image examples. Uh, there's comments oh, that awesome. we've had some more submissions. Let me know which ones of these have replies. <laughs> oh my god, this is great.
<laughs> okay, well, Thomas posted one. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, hmm? Okay, I'm going to finish reading this and then I'll keep scrolling down. Uh, blue t shirt with text reading I'm just my dog's social media manager. Abandoned his dog. Was this yours? Okay. Uh, so for this, what would be the context of it, though? Or did you add the alt text in in the image? Right. Um, so to repeat that, that was um, that was the caption that he had for his, but it doesn't really convey the vividness of, uh, you know, it's outside, it's snowing, it's in the mountains. Um, so that might need to be added. Okay, Thomas, do any of you? Oh, yes. I actually have a question on that. I make internet, like a number of people here probably do. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I make the internet, and people, other people populate it. She makes the internet. Yep. As, well, as other people do. But I will often be downstream of folks selecting images, right? So the content producers have a package of, of photos, and they'll just put them in there. I don't always know the purpose of it besides to fill space. So what would be a good metric for knowing how much detail or even just having it be all very good question. Uh, so overall, just to repeat, because I think some of that broke up, um, a lot of times, especially when you make internets, you get a lot of pictures that are just kind of handed to you as a, as a package, or uh, they may just come from some other source that you don't have control over, and so you don't have the full in understanding of the intention of the person who took the, the picture. Uh, and that's true for a whole lot of different scenarios. Um, the basic rule is then you just do a visual description of the image. So you don't do an interpretation of, okay, this is not necessarily, you don't do an interpretation of their intentions. You do an, int an interpretation, if any at all, of your own perception of it. If it's something that's specifically journalistic, then that gets into kind of a different space. Um, but so for a lot of the things like on Project Describe here, for some of the pictures that come up, when you hit context, you get a 404 page. And that's probably because not all of them are coming from the site. Like they have 30,000 images. I doubt all of them are on their site. They're probably just in archives. They might be used in uh, multimedia packages, whatever. So you don't have any of the things around it. And so at that point, you just kind of do your best to say, okay, well, I'm gonna describe what shows up on here. So that way, if I didn't have the context for the whale and know that, that uh, it was describing, okay, well, a whale is swimming through icy waters in Alaska, I would probably say like a top-down view of a whale swimming through icy waters. Even though that's gonna be redundant with other things, it's the best that I could do with the information that I had. So like uh, museum descriptions get that way a lot just because a lot of artists are dead. You can't go and ask. Um, and a lot of people argue about the intentions of the artist. I mean, that's a favorite pastime. Yes? Read out the URL. There's a request just to read out the URL. Oh, sure, so the, the URL um, which I'll tweet out a link to the slides afterward, which also has it in there. But the, the URL is project describe, all one word, dot A-M-N-H dot org. That's the American Museum of Natural History, uh, their project. Yes? Um, are all texts translated to like other languages? They should be. Uh, the question was, are all texts translated? Uh, they should be, absolutely. Um, that's kind of on the burden of whoever is providing the alt text. Um, I mean, if I'm just farting around on social media and posting pictures, I'm not translating my alt text into 16 languages. But I, I work on Google Docs, any images that we have in there, we have alt text and we translate that into all the languages that we support. There's a lot of them. Yeah. I wonder if there's a way for like, someone to receive alt text in like, a preferred language. Right? Um, usually the way that that would work is the same way as, oh, let me repeat. Um, so the question was about an automatic way of somebody to receive alt text in the language that would be preferred. Uh, you basically just do it in the same language that the, U the UI itself would be presented in. Or in the case of an article that's a different language than the site that it's included on, you would include it as the same language as the article. So basically like the smallest granularity of content down to that image, whatever language that is. Right. Well, on that subject, if there's, if there's a website 
site that's primarily geared towards English-speaking people, but there are also like eight other common languages that may be translated to use in Google Translate. Um, will will it, it it's, I'm assuming it's not going to translate those, and you have to. Oh, so if you're doing if you're doing a web page translation using like an automated tool that would translate an entire page. Google Translate, and um, there is there are um, basically about eight common languages that can be translated into. Okay, so the example was using uh, Google Translate, which you're using, mm -hmm. uh, and there's different common languages that you can translate to. Um, I have no idea. I haven't tried that. Hopefully. Yes. Um, I'm I'm wondering also uh, how much. The grammatical structure of ASL influenced the way you do all text now, because I know that for um, I, I've done I've done uh, freelance translation and interpretation in the past, and I know that the sort of the um, the stru and I know that the structure of lang the languages that I do speak um, has also changed the way I do all text, and that like sort of like again like. Um, some languages tend to do um, like the way you should with all text, they're much more setting the stage first before going to the granular, whereas English tends to be much more free word order. And I'm just sort of wondering if, 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 uh, ASL, if ASL's grammatical structure also influenced uh, your all text with that. If it has, it's totally subconscious. So like if I was looking at some of these pictures, I would describe them very diff differently in ASL than I would in English in terms of the actual structure itself and the details that I include. Yeah. Um, because in, let's see, in this image, for instance, um, I would not start with looking south. I would start with setting up the entire physical space of the Hudson River with the cliffs and the bridge, and then say, and here's the perspective. Because I'm playing with like this kind of space, and so I would set up the river first and then the cliffs on the other side, and then the bridge going across this way, and then looking that way. Okay. And then I would explain like right here, and then kind of enlarge that spot so I can explain what it is that uh, I wanted to highlight. So mostly the, uh, the descriptions of the images would be very different in ASL in terms of the approach of explanation and the details that I include, simply because explaining things in English, you can get really flowery and really vague, and in ASL, you can't really. Like, you have a physical space that you're working with. And so that's how you communicate. But the overall structure of starting big and getting more down to details uh, exactly follows. Because, like, setting up the river and then the cliffs and the bridge and everything, and then setting up perspective and then the focus is starting big and getting more and more narrow. Perfect. That answers my question. Thanks. Cool. Cameron. Hi, Cameron. Do you, um, do you ever find yourself writing descriptions? all text and then realize I should just put this in the tweet or in the Facebook post because it's meaningful beyond just the image. So it's like some of these some of these things you wrote were kind of like poetic. <laughs> Well, Facebook doesn't have alt text, so I include all of my captions right next to the picture anyway, so I figure I may as well make it helpful for people, which is why I do like the highlighting of the dude with an umbrella. Um, and that's why, it's why I set things up in the way that I do when I write it. So like with the instance of the dog flashing the world, like that's why I tried to make it sound as like beautiful and scenic and, and peaceful and, and pristine as possible before you get like dog crotch. <laughs> My other question was, have you ever had people call you out for being cheeky or interpretive in your own text? Um, like, the example I'm thinking is, well, I can <laughs> Are you calling me out right now? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a risk that you can treat, you can have, like, inside jokes, basically, for sighted people in your own text. Um, Unconsciously, like I've done it before, where I'll make reference to the image in the alt text in ways that is kind of like an inside joke. Gotcha. Um, I really make an effort not to do that. Nobody's called me out yet. Um, I've had the opposite, where somebody actually thought that I had written alt text for an image, but there wasn't an image there. It was just my description. Um, 
But yeah, so far nobody has said like stop being a jerk. Just write a description. <laughs> Yes. Um, I guess sort of in a similar vein, as someone who doesn't use a screen reader and like I don't rely on alt text, um, so how do you figure out when you're doing something that's maybe not best practices, like say writing a description that's way too long and annoying people because they can't stay past it? Um, one of the keys is just like, uh, like Thomas brought up earlier, does it fit in the tweet? Mm -hmm. So like if you're going on and on and on about details, does it really need to be there? Um, so like there's, uh, there was an example that I was about to use and it totally left my mind. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the basic idea is every word that you're putting in there should add meaning to the overall experience that somebody is getting from the description. Mm -hmm. So like with this image of the dude in a kayak with an umbrella, I should really give him credit. Um, there's all these kinds of details which I could talk about for ages because I live in the neighborhood and I know the history of the place and I'm a history nerd. Um, but I purposefully left all that out because the only thing that I wanted to do was the setup of the environment, which is just a rainy day in the Hudson River. And then the punchline, which is here's this guy chilling out on the water in a kayak with a purple umbrella. Um, but there's all kinds of details that I could have added to that, but it wouldn't have added anything to the overall feeling. If anything, it would have distracted from it. And so that's kind of why with, uh, with this slide, before I got to that caption, the two questions are what do you want to highlight and what distracts from that? So anything that's distracting from that needs to be just tossed. And anything that adds to it, even if it's something that's subtle, it may be important to include. Um, so like with the practice one that I pulled up, here we are. So like one of the details that I included uh, in my caption for this, because I thought it was hysterical, is that this is written in chunky marker in a bathroom wall in a bar. That's the context. If you don't know that it was taken in a bar, you don't know if it was taken on a bathroom wall, then you just include the general description of what it is, but because I had that information, I thought it was important. If you are sighted and looking at the picture, you can't necessarily tell that it's on a bathroom wall. Like it kind of looks like a bathroom wall, but it could be anywhere really. It's just anywhere where people scrawl graffiti about things. Um, and on the distraction note, like that's why I also didn't include any of the other things, because like you can make out somebody scrawled like repeatedly in pen, pension equals jackass, uh, up to the right of that, but that wasn't the point of the picture that I was taking, so it's like, ah, eh, that's, that's not really adding. I mean, it's funny on its own, but it's not adding to this. Yes? Uh, additionally, I think, uh, kind of to tie into what you were both just asking, um, do you get called out? I, I find myself to be more cheeky <coughs> in my Twitter posts than I do for work, because I've have professional boundaries. <laughs> but, um, and, and I think on, on Twitter, everyone knows they're a little more casual, hopefully. Okay, so I'm going to repeat that up until, okay. So on Twitter, you tend to be a little more cheeky with your post than you do in, in kind of your professional descriptions because it's Twitter and you have professional boundaries. Um, on Twitter, I missed the inaudible part too because I was looking at the captions. Uh, what were you saying for the last you, part? Do you follow the same, or do you try also try to be very professional on Twitter and follow more strict guidelines? Um, I, so I'll be honest at this point, I don't use Twitter. <laughs> I stopped like a couple of months ago and I haven't missed it. Um, but when I did and when I posted pictures, um, the captions that I would provide for the alt text were professional. The content may not be. But so the overall point is if I'm posting something that's really rude in a picture, I want somebody who's using a screen reader because I have a lot of friends who use Twitter, who use screen readers and can't see the pictures. I want them to get the same experience and the same informa information. Um, so like, uh, as an example, not to get political for a second, but I'm gonna. Um, so before the election, I was walking through Harlem to the train and somebody had written in gigantic block letters, it was on a fence, it was glorious, it was like eight feet high, big, huge block letters, it took up longer than a city bus and it just said, fuck Trump. And I tweeted that. 
because Twitter recommended that I follow him. And so that was my response. But when I provided alt text, that's what I described. And so now all of you get that picture without me having to post it because I just described it. Yes? <laughs> okay, I'm not going to so do this description so justice. Can you stand up and like speak? In the oh. <laughs> I'm not going to remember it all. Okay. Uh, that's it. Which one? Okay, great. Okay. And I can stand over here. I tweeted a photo of fish that had washed, washed ashore on the beach. Um, I was there on Christmas Day. And the fish were frozen, but their eyes had been picked up by all the seagulls. And I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> now, there was a smell, but I didn't want to put that in the alt text. And so because that was so <laughs> <laughs> I should put it in there. <laughs> if you're providing a caption to everybody about how funny that was, then yes, include all of these things. <laughs> Yes. Just sort of a, a follow up. Would it not make more sense to put some of that in the caption after the right? Like, right. Have the, the description of the image in the alt text itself, and then right because the fact that they stunk. Possibly this is funny to also people not using a screen reader. Oh yes, absolutely. So like in that instance, if you have the ability to add alt text, then yeah, just put the alt text that's there that is helpful for the visuals on the picture, and then the caption below it, everybody can just enjoy. Um, the only reason why I tend to blend the two is because if I'm posting in a place that doesn't support alt text, then I have to put it there because I have no other place for it. But if you, if you can, then by all means, just do the visual description and then the caption that everybody gets. Yes? Um, how can I view the alt text on Twitter? I know that that's not the purpose of it, but um, can I view it? So the question is, can you view it? Um, it's not the purpose for you to view the alt text, but can you? Um, the answer is not easily. Okay. Uh, the easiest way is to turn on a screen reader. <laughs> um, if you're on the website, you can right-click on the image and inspect it, and then look in the DOM inspector, and then look at the attribute that's on the alt text, and then you can read it there. But no, there isn't really a way. Uh, Cameron, do you know something there are different? There browser plugins that will surface alt text visually. Um, I don't know one off the top of my head, but I can post a note um, on the <coughs> computer. So you find me afterwards, and I'll, and I'll show it to you. Awesome. Thanks, Cameron. Yes, back there. Um, just to follow on the question about what you should put in the alt text and what you should put in the caption, what's best practice for repetition? Like, I mean, should you avoid putting things in the alt text that you can put in the caption because you don't want someone to hear it twice? What if you have control over all of the things, it is best not to have repetition because then you're having a screen reader that's going through the same stuff more than once. Um, sometimes that'll get challenging if you specifically have to describe the visuals and some of that overlaps inherently with the description that somebody else wrote because that may include like uh, you know, General Washington on a horse and a thing. And then in the, in, in the alt text, you have to include like there's a dude on a horse on a thing. Um, so some of that is going to overlap sometimes, but as a best practice, if, if you can avoid it, it's best to, just because there's only so many words that somebody's going to put up with on page, and the fewer that they have to put up with, the better. Yeah. Yes? Can you clarify the difference between alt text, description, and caption? Okay, clarify the, dis the difference between alt text, description, and caption. So one of the examples that I used in the very, very start, um, so this is the picture in question, uh, which the alt text was the large hardcover book with yellowing braille pages. So the, this is alt text because it is shorter and more concise, and this would probably be within the context of a place where it is explaining what the book is. Because if you're writing an article about this book, then you would probably include uh, the contents of that little sign. You would include information around it, and so you would get all of the caption around it inherently from the content. If you are providing uh, 
a dis full description and caption, it's gonna be a lot longer. You'll notice mine get really long. Um, still fits in Twitter. Um, but for the full description and caption, you want to include things like the contents of signs that are, on, that are uh, visible on the screen so that somebody who really wants to pick apart the image, if they want, can do the same with the description that you've provided. Um, captions, I'm, I'm gonna add a fourth, um, but I'm gonna get to captions, no, a, a fourth and a fifth, oh my. Um, okay, so captions are basically what Mirabai is doing here. These are live captions. This is just, this is a description of what is showing up here. Uh, if there was a loud bang that occurred or some other sound effect, like on a movie soundtrack. Thank you, Cameron, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Right, like laughter. So this, these are captions. This is providing you, uh, this is, <laughs> Cameron's lost it. <laughs> uh, so this is tr trying to provide through written text uh, what is happening audibly in this room. So there's a lot of talking going on because that's what I'm here doing. But occasionally there's sounds of Cameron making me jump and then laughter afterward. Um, Subtitles are different. So subtitles, uh, a lot of people confuse the two between subtitles and captions. Subtitles are only the spoken word being translated into another language or in the same language for that matter. So subtitles, if this was only subtitles, you wouldn't get the laughter, you wouldn't get the clapping sound, you would only get the text itself. Um, and then there was a last one, audio, audio description. So in audio description, if we were to try to create one for this overall presentation, it would be a lot easier because it would be basically me standing in a room and then the slides going by, and I'm already giving the description of the images, so we wouldn't have to provide that. But for something like a television show, it would, between the, the uh, dialogue itself within the pauses, fill in those gaps uh, when needed and as vividly as necessary to provide somebody who can't see the screen with enough context of the movement and what's happening on the screen so that the next line will make sense. Um, so like if, as an example of this, uh, if there's a scene where somebody is just sitting at a desk calmly and then somebody else rushes in silently and clocks them on the back of the head, don't, <laughs> thank you Cameron. Um, but if you can't see the screen, you have no idea what happened. All you hear is just a smack and that's it and maybe a clunk as they fall down, but you have no context. You have no idea that somebody else ran in from the other room like Cameron, uh, grinning. <laughs> um, so the audio description provides you that. Um, so you asked a question about three things and I answered five, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, Thomas. I just wanted to add a comment on to the point of Twitter having the ability to add these descriptions. Um, so we've been doing the meetup for about three years. I, I learned from uh, Dan Speaker that this is Chicago meetup <coughs> that a company called Buffer, they're, they're working, they basically work to let you share content you know, on a bunch of different social media platforms. They're working on accessibility, and I had written them just asking them some questions. So they told me that right now Twitter is the only social media even enabling. Talk toward the mic. Uh, this is the only social media even enabling this functionality at this time. So one, it's like awesome that Twitter is doing this, but pretty much every other social media really needs to have this capability, you know, ability to add text descriptions. So it's really not just. Facebook or any other like Twitter's the only one right now making this really transparent. So, yeah. Comment. Thank you. Yes. Do you know? Uh, do modern search engines take advantage of alt text? Very good question. Yes, they do heavily. Uh, also with captions, also with subtitles. Uh, basically, any written text that can be parsed, uh, they will parse it and it will add to it. So. It is very beneficial for search engines. Yes, Kevin. Do you have opinions on automated <laughs> uh, image descriptions using camera vision? I'm just going to make sure that the yes. Um, yes, I have. <laughs> So automated descriptions will give you some kind of a sense. Um, so actually, if you're using Facebook, Facebook does some uh, automatic description. Uh, which is cool because most people don't add captions for their images ever. Um, so if somebody posts a picture and they just say, post like, oh, isn't this cute? You don't know if it's a dog, you don't know if it's a flower, you don't know if it's a boat, you have no idea. 
And so Facebook at least gives you some keywords where it's like, okay, this, prob this image probably includes this. And it will give you a few keywords with some con that they have a reasonable confidence that it includes. But it's not going to give you things like it's uh, two puppies flopped over each other with a bow on them. Like that's a very different experience than just like there's probably dogs here. Um, so it's a, yeah, the image and conf image recognition and computer vision is really interesting and it's getting to the point where it's actually being used uh, on a lot of different platforms, which is super cool because before it was basically like IBM Research could do it and nobody else could. Uh, but now it's getting to the point where like Facebook will do it on a massive scale across all of these pictures, which is super cool. But it's not the same thing as an actual human written description because that's getting to the point of it and it's also giving interpretation and it's also giving context. Yes? Uh, my question is related to other types of markup we could use other than alt tags. Like, is there anything else we should be doing with the markup on our sites? Like, ARIA roles, HTML5 elements, like, is there anything that's underutilized that we could be doing more of to improve accessibility? All of that. Oh, that's good. Yes, uh, all of that is thoroughly underutilized. <laughs> all of that and way more. Um, yeah. I'm not really going to get specific because that's a whole other talk. Um, yes? Me? On the side to the left, uh, against the wall. Oh, uh, so I, I work at Broadway.com and uh, we often get promotional pictures from producers of new shows and we have no idea what the contacts are and we would give pictures on the site and they're almost intentionally left figures so that people would get a feel of sense of what the show is going to be like without knowing the story. How would you navigate all types of pictures? Um, so the question was about, uh, so this was pictures for promotions yeah, for things so that are inherently left, yeah, so the so pictures themselves are vague? Yeah, so uh, the pictures are taken from uh, promotional shoots for upcoming I mean, Broadway show. And, uh, oh, okay, for Broadway the shows. Story, you would, you would not story, so they were kind of left on the side with a bit of fuel and a sense of what the show is going to be. Okay, so different pictures taken from different angles, but providing no context for like what the show is going to be like, any context about the, what the show is about. Yeah. Um, but how do you provide alt text? You provide alt text the same way that somebody looking at it with no context would get. You could say like, okay, well, there's two people in 19th century garb talking at a bar. You could say, you know, there's, there's two guys in modern street clothes fighting, or you could say there's two ballerinas dancing, or whatever it happens to be. Like you can still provide enough context so that you can get the visuals from it, even if you have no idea about the context. So you also skip the, the third step with the kind of Yeah, the interpretation step is something that is optional. It's if, if it actually adds to it. So like with, I'm going back and forth through all my slides, I should really do this in a more sensible way. Um, so like with this picture, there's no need for interpretation. Like it's just setup, which is just bathroom wall with graffiti around it. And then, it, and then the punchline of always buy your magic beans from a trusted retailer. Like there's no interpretation needed whatsoever. It's just left to somebody. So it's not always recommended. It's helpful in some cases in, uh, like with art specifically, it can be really helpful because uh, art description is one really freaking hard but two, fascinating just because you are trying to convey a piece, a work of art, it might be a masterpiece, you're trying to convey that to somebody who cannot see the piece. So like Mona Lisa, go. You have three sentences. How do you convey that? Like you have to start with the style because otherwise the person has no idea what you're talking about. And then you have the subject of the woman and then you can describe the pose and you can describe the expression on her face, but you inherently have to include an interpretation. Um, there was an amazing talk that we had at a meetup here uh, a couple of years ago um, in which, uh, I don't think we have that up because the video got weird, um, but it was great. It was on audio description and how to do that. And there was a woman from the Guggenheim whose name I forget, and then a, pr a woman from the Met whose name I forget. Um, it's all in meetup. We have the description and everything. Um, but they talked about, among other things, how do you actually write descriptions for art pieces? 
and you can get all kinds of different interpretations. It depends on who you ask. I mean, that's the same if like you and I go to the art museum. It's like, what do you see? We're going to say two completely different things. It's just when you're providing alternative text, you have to start with the context. Like, okay, is this an abstract piece? Like, did Pollock throw painted things? Or is this sculpture? What are you actually looking at? And then from there, you can narrow it down to, okay, well, now we're getting into the details of smooth surfaces and curves, and now you can talk about interpretation of, uh, you know, this reminds me of the, the moves of a dancer. There was one more question with Lale, and then I think we're going to need to wrap up. Okay. All right. Uh, my question is a bit technical. So, um, so I work for the city of New York, and one of the things I'm working on is um, we have a template that's kind of used for a lot of our websites and on that template is share this on Facebook share this on Twitter but it's it's a CSS image and I'm not sure that there's a way to add all the text to that or is there is that something you know how to answer or? Um, so if it's a CSS image I'm assuming you mean like uh, using a background image that sort of thing yeah there are ways to provide text that screen readers will read out uh, it gets really hacky because you'd basically have to put the text in the element and then hide the text from showing up visually. And there's different ways you can do that. Cool. Um, it's a lot more complicated than just having an image with alt text. So if it's possible, I recommend doing that. But if it's not possible, there are ways. Um, so if you look, if you do some searches for uh, basically that, you should up, come up with some examples. Um, if not, I can help you find some. Uh, we need to wrap up, but I did have one more announcement. This is totally unrelated. Um, so last year we had a speaker from uh, Parsons, the new school of design, come and talk about uh, Open Style Lab, which is this super cool project. Uh, basically pairing uh, designers and uh, people with disabilities and uh, people who know technology into teams to create pieces of clothing for uh, the pe person with a disability, like their specific case of a problem that the, they need to solve. Uh, so she came and talked about that program. Uh, I had the honor this past fall of being a critic, guest critic of uh, the fall semester. It was super cool. The program was awesome. Um, Peter was one of the clients who's seated, seated over there. Uh, who got an awesome jacket, like I want the jacket. Uh, but anyway, they are putting out a call for people who need uh, a piece of clothing that would be great f uh, for this semester. So they're, they're getting the students ramped up now. Um, the call is open until January 15th. Um, OpenStyleLab.com has some background information. I have an email that I can send out to the meetup group entirely that includes um, a lot more specifics uh, from Grace herself who runs the program. Uh, and uh, sent the information to me. Um, and it's just a simple form. You fill it out with like, okay, what, like your mode of contact. Uh, can you come and meet with us this many times a semester? Like what kind of need do you have for this? Um, it's a super cool program. So if you are interested, if you have a disability and a, a problem that would be solved with specifically like clothing design, then it's a super awesome program and there's not a lot of opportunities to do this sort of thing. So I highly recommend uh, sending it. But for everybody on live stream and everywhere else, I'll be sending out the email for that uh, later on. But thanks for coming. Well, that's it. Uh, I want to say thank you again to ThoughtBot and to SSB Bart nearby with white coat captioning and Jolly. And uh, thank you to all of you. Join the meetup group. It's meetup.com slash A11YNYC. If you're not already on there, join it. We'll send out announcements. And uh, we'll put out notes on tonight's presentation as well as uh, you can see notes from presentations before. And we're also on YouTube. The recordings are up at um, on A11YNYC's account on YouTube. Um, so feel free to hang out for a few more minutes. We need to be out of here in like 20 minutes. Are we OK? Yeah. OK. So uh, 20 minutes, I'll let you know when you absolutely need to be out of here. Um, <laughs> in the meantime, grab a drink, talk, hang out. Thanks again.